very good evening to everyone i am ankit kanodia from smart sync services a sebi registered investment advisory firm welcome to the 8th episode of mission smile investing karwa a mission smile initiative where we invite veterans from the industry every month who have at least two decades of experience in the stock market and learn from their vast journey and experience for those who are watching this for the first time mission smile stands for making new stock market investors learn it through engaging research before we begin i would request everyone to please keep yourself on mute and switch off the video so that we can have a seamless discussion and soak in all the wisdom you may type in your questions on the chat box we'll take all the questions from time to time during the course of the session so let's begin today our guest is rohit chauhan rohit chauhan is an engineer mba with 25 plus years of experience in different functions in large corporations in india and abroad rohit was introduced to the investment world in the mid 1990s when he started managing his family finances rohit has followed the value investing philosophy for the last 20 years in managing money for himself and others who have entrusted their capital to him that was about his professional introduction now let me share my personal association with rohit i'm talking about 2012 13 when there was no social media at least not in india and today we know it is a jungle out there right but back then there was no noise and i vividly remember only three blogs safal niveshak for beginners pandu professor blog for of professor sanjay bakshi was an advanced level blog um, blog for going deep and then there was rohit's blog by the name value investing india the best part about rohit's blog was that he used to write detailed analysis of various sectors and also about stocks and he openly shared what worked and what didn't that is what got got me hooked to his blog and i never stopped reading until he stopped posting so normally it's a discussion where i ask the guest a few questions and they answer but today we are going to make a change due to some reason rohit cannot come on camera so i have emailed him the questions and he will answer them with the help of a presentation so you don't have to look at a blank screen and it becomes more interactive that way right so rohit thank you so much for agreeing to do this we'll start with an opening remark from your side and then straight away move to the q and a thank you thanks ankit uh, thanks for uh, having me on this and uh, you know welcome everyone uh, appreciate uh, all of you making time for this one for this particular session what i will do is i will uh, you can hear me clearly right uh, okay yes yes right so what i will do is i will uh, i'll start off with a small i uh, based on the questions which uh, ankit has shared i have uh, i've created a slide deck but i do not want to spend uh, 20 25 minutes just taking you through a presentation because that is not fun so i will i will start off with one one topic as a discussion you know of maybe 5 to 10 minutes i will take through those talking points and then we'll open it up for q and a i will go to the relevant section of the presentation because the talking points are over there so that it's it's more a structured kind of a response but of if not then obviously we will uh, keep it interactive i will open up maybe let's say a chart or a screen or something just to kind of because you know my you have to give me you have to excuse me for that i i don't have a very strong memory i cannot rattle off numbers off my head uh, so usually what i do is i will uh, you know at least uh, try to uh, you know use uh, something on the screen itself to talk to so give me one second uh, let me share my computer and let me know ankit if you can uh, if you can you know see it clearly yes rohit i can see it okay can, so let me the... yeah perfect right so let's uh, start off with the uh, the 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 standard disclaimers that uh, any companies we talk about over here uh, are for educational purposes only 
uh, there is no recommendation and uh, those of you who would have followed me some time back maybe on the blog or would have seen me write about write on my uh, twitter feed i usually don't talk too much about companies uh, for the simple reason that uh, i think long back uh, there were a few things among among the few things which i which i realized and i have uh, found to be very helpful in life is that uh, better not to give people financial advice and definitely not not stock advice whether it is asked for or whether it is not asked for uh for the simple reason that uh, when a stock works out uh most of the people think it is because you know they they you know they it is because to their credit which which may or may not be the case but that's fine right but if it does not work out then the person giving the advice is to blame so for anybody uh, giving out advice uh i have personally found that there is no upside and there is all downside so you know why why get into that particular situation so uh you know even if let's say um uh, there was no sebi requirement you know i would i've never i've never tried to go down that path it's a, it's a no win situation for me right so so let's let's start off uh, i'm going to talk talk about one topic uh which is mistakes right because i know this gets discussed a lot uh so i'm just going to talk for a few minutes on this topic and then we will uh we will go about the the presentation or we'll we'll start with the q and a so uh, how do we how do we define a mistake in investing right like when everybody talks about a mistake what do we mean by mistake so we'll say you have lost money in a position we have missed out a multi bagger we were looking at something a friend recommended something or we read about something on social media and we you know we did not buy it or maybe we sold too early or we sold too late all kinds of timing issues we'll call that a mistake but i would like to turn that question around let's say you are running a business right let's say you are you are a retailer you you are a grocer or you are a retailer uh what how does a retailer behave or how does a businessman behave he is not going to complain or a retailer or a restaurant owner is not going to complain every time feel down feel dejected beat himself or herself up saying uh this particular inventory you know i i purchased this particular clothing for this particular season and out of the 100 pieces which i bought, which i purchased 95 pieces uh, did not sell at my uh, mrp what i i had to sell it at a discount what do retailers do right they mark down the price the typical and I, the terminology which is used in retail is called shrinkage right so let's say you bought 100 uh, units for 100 rupees and you mark it up for 120 and you sell it i know i'm i'm giving a very small number but you know we'll just live with 100 rupees right so i'm selling it for 120 rupees knowing from my past history that i i cannot forecast it accurately i can forecast this plus or minus 90 sometimes i will buy 100 and the actual demand would be 110 sometimes i will buy 100 and the demand will be 90 so either i will fall short or i will i will have excess and then i have to mark down outside the fashion or people do not want it and i will sell it for 10 rupees less knowing fully well that this happens i will usually adjust my price for 120 although my average profit i want to keep it as 150 or 15 rupees or you know i sell it at 150 so what do you do you usually look at your past history and a retailer would adjust their pricing accordingly so think of yourself as an investor in that terms i know it's not easy but in the end of the day uh, when you make a mistake it's not about you maybe it's an unavoidable uh, part of this uh, active investing thing which we do right uh, you can avoid a mistake 100% which is what a lot of people from our or previous generation did what did they do they just go ahead and invest in 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 a, in a fixed deposit right then there is no short of putting money into a bank or some place which goes uh, which goes bust which thankfully does not happen very often you will never go wrong right at least notionally you will never go wrong you will always invest it in a fixed deposit make your 
six, seven percent, whatever it is, and never have to experience failure. Although you are you are falling behind inflation, and eventually something will uh, inflation catches up with you. So most investors, I would say, spend too much time thinking about their mistake. And I think the best option is you know don't agonize over it, learn learn from it, keep notes about it, and then move on because you will make a lot of mistakes. And uh, I can I think one thing which I can tell you from experience is that they never stop. Mistakes never stop, right? It's not like once after you have invested for ten years, it's all good, perfect. Now you are a hundred uh, percent perfect investor. Actually, the only time you are a hundred percent perfect investor is. When you are talking about your investment on, or when somebody is talking about their investment on social media, on where or when they are trying to sell something, right? So as long as you keep that in mind, that the best of the investors, uh, one minute, let me. You have to keep in mind that the best of the investors do not get it right more than. Let. Get it right only sixty to seventy percent of the time, right? Again, keep in mind that this is not a multiple choice exam, right? The big advantage of investing is when you get it wrong, you would have all heard about it. Easy to hear and obviously not easy to practice. Is that it's not? It does not matter how many you get right. right? It's about how much you make when you get it right versus how much do you lose. The max you can lose if you have not if you are not leveraged is hundred percent of your investment. The max you can make, there is no upside. Now that's where the entire fun of investing is. You can lose hundred percent, but in another position, if you make three times, you still on your portfolio level, you are still up by a considerable amount, and that is what usually happens. A few winners will account for a good year, for a good, uh, and I will show it with examples at a later point, with a good uh, with a good return over the long run. But at the same time, you know you have to be very careful. You do not make Sort of a a fatal kind of a mistake, right? Which will completely knock you off the game. Don't go for leverage. I keep writing it on my uh, Twitter feed, right? Do not have excessive concentration. There is only one one Bar Warren Buffett. There was only one uh, Rakesh Junjunwala. All these people forget about uh, uh, <clears throat> the survivorship bias, which means you know we only see those investors who are successful. Those who those who went bust are no longer visible. They are not talking about themselves uh, on social media. They've long left the market, right? So you only see successful investors. How many times have we seen somebody who is on social media and keeps talking about all the money which they are losing, right? That 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 never happens. So uh, you know, even excess concentration, unless you you have demonstrated proof to yourself, right? I'm not talking of Trying to prove it to anyone, you have proved that your batting average or your average of your your success rate is so high that you can go for you know for for excess concentration. And what do my I mean by excess concentration? A couple of positions, four or five positions, that is that is quite quite high concentration. Sometimes even you know lesser than that. So the the most important thing is you have to you have to build. Um, you should know your you should know what is your success rate and then you build it into your into your portfolio construction into your strategy and we can you know we can dive dive a little bit deeper into that also later let's uh, next slide on this one let's see i guess so what are the types of mistakes at least what are the types of mistakes which i have done in the past and by the way you know these have not stopped they continue to keep happening and what's the fun if you always get something hundred percent right? But but the nature of the the nature of the thing is that you will never get it hundred percent. The most common for me is that I've from time to time I've been swept by a narrative. So I as Ankit shared right, I started off investing in um, in the mid nineties, uh, and then uh, for most of you may have not been around in the markets at that time, uh, but. I got, uh, you know, I went into the IT stocks. There was IT, so very similar to what we had very recently, right? In the US, partly in India, platform companies, SaaS companies, same kind of a, a, a euphoria called as the dot-com boom happened in 2000. And by that time, I had read quite a bit on Warren Buffett and done quite a bit of reading. The unfortunate bit is, no matter how much you read, 
uh, and how much you hear somebody say something, uh, greed is not easy to is it is not easy to avoid. So again, got swept up by uh, uh, by IT stocks in two thousand. Same same way partially by financial services companies in two thousand eighteen, and from time to time on individual stocks. So, what do I mean by narrative? At a certain point, got so sucked in or got so influenced by the story that I was no longer analyzing the uh, the company or I was not critical enough, right? And that uh, usually is a recipe for disaster. So that was, you know, that's the most common narrative keeps happening for me time to time, for me from time to time. Again, have had, uh, have done incorrect evaluation of companies and I've listed some of the names down. Again, uh, these are examples. They are, as much as there is no recommendation to buy, uh, there is no recommendation to sell also, right? I don't hold any of these companies or even the the advisory we have, uh, RC Capital Management does not hold any of these companies, but we have held this, these companies from time to time, right? So there is Shemaru, this is uh, Hinduja Global Services, HGS, CMAC, that's a shipping, uh, that's a, uh, uh, an offshore drilling company, uh, GRP. Again, Crompton Greaves, way back, I haven't put the time, but this is 2000. 13 and 14, where we had the previous promoters, not the current promoters, by the way. So this is the combined company, Crompton Greaves, had the electrical business and the CapEx business. Uh, this is uh, this is 2012, before uh, I think the demerger happened and then the business was also sold. So again, you know, evaluated the management uh, yeah, incorrectly. The prior management went on an acquisition spree in the in the in the uh, in 2000. 8, 9 to around 11, 12 time frame. And obviously, as we have seen with a lot of other companies like Tata Steel and Novellis, uh, Tata Steel and uh, uh, I'm forgetting the name, Chorus, I think, yeah, Chorus in UK, or uh, there, there was this acquisition of Novellis, I think it was Hindalco. A lot of these acquisitions turned out to be very expensive and a lot of value destruction happened. So, same thing with Prompton Greaves also. Again, a lot of good growth was happening at that point of time. And uh, uh, the incorrect evaluation was that the CEO, before uh, he uh, he quit, he was continuously selling his own stock. So again, when he left the company or when he moved on to become the chairman or something of the company, not chairman, I think it was vice chairman or event or the board of directors, the market did not like. And, you know, obviously the uh, those were also the days where the, the stock, price correction used to be slower uh, these days in the blink of an eye and you know we can we can talk about it later the stock market structure has changed uh, and you know, any reaction upside or downside is very swift as we just recently saw in the last few days also right and it's obviously both an opportunity and a problem i too right uh, sometimes you know the mistakes are not just it's not just about getting something wrong. It's also about getting a bad, you know, bad timing, right? You, you get into something, not, I would not say early, but my, the classic example, and I have a few more is Balaji Amines. So Balaji Amines in 2012, same business. They were in the Amines business. They also had a hotel. They, I mean, as of today, they also have that, that hotel business where they were developing this extra land and they were developing this hotel. So bought it in 2000. 11 12 time frame as a as a very cheap value kind of uh, an investment and i've done this uh, session earlier with uh, with prince also where i spoke about uh, and i think it's there on one of these other sessions i think i did it either with uh, prince or maybe it was with um, uh, uh, ishmohit i forget where where i spoke about you know some of these companies where i where I bought them as cheap value investments, which were, which, which is what I used to do uh, back then. So I bought Balaji Mines at that point of time and the stock was selling at roughly maybe 45, 50 bucks. So it's obviously painful to even look at this example. And then nothing was happening, right? So the problem is not that nothing was happening and the management was still diverting cash flows uh, into the into the hotel business. That's not the mistake. And the mistake which was there is that Although I knew about the company, which is why I said the first thing, right? Do not take it personally. And one of the first steps of not taking it personally means that once you have 
studied and analyzed a company and you had to sell, right? For whatever reason, right? Don't just push it away or don't just take it out of your mind that it's, you know, there's nothing personal about, about this, right? You bought a stock, it didn't work, you moved on. But you did the work, right? I'm assuming you would have spent days, weeks, months. And I've, I've always believed in doing at least a good amount of research before I before I get into a, a company. So obviously, I would read a lot of the annual reports, make notes, do some sector study, all of that, look at the valuation, and then, then buy the company. So even back then, I was doing uh, weeks and, you know, days and days and weeks and weeks of research. So obviously, I knew about the company. So all that we would have taken when the company started doing well, would have to just do a little brush up and see, you know, how, how the sector was changing, right? The whole narrative around specialty, com- you know, specialty chemicals and this and that had started coming up. And by the way, uh, again, another company, which we have, which we have held for co- quite some time in our advisory and no longer hold it in the advisory, but I keep it as a tracking position is Vinati Organics. So I, you know, we had that, that same company even then. So it's not like, uh, uh, um, I did not know about the sector, but I used to take these kind of things very personally. Uh, although almost like, you know, uh, like some girlfriend or something has, has said no, and then you know, I will never go back. Right. So the mistake was not looking at that particular company again, whereas it should have been a very easy thing. Right. And then what has happened, right? The stock is up hundred X. So think about, I, I can assure you, if you, you know, as you keep investing, you will realize that some of the companies over time, the management will change, the the market scenario will change and they will take off. So it's, it's a mistake not to revisit it. So I keep, I have, you know, I've looked at a lot of companies over the years. That's the advantage of investing for a long time. So if, if something has started happening in a company, I will quickly look at it and at least keep an open mind about, look at the notes which I've had. What was I thinking about then? Why did it not work? And what is changing now, right? At least I have a, a little bit of an advantage that I know about the company. The disadvantage is that often you have a very dated kind of a view about a company. So that happened with Balaji Mines. It's very recently happened with Pokarna also. Uh, again, this is the artificial stone uh, company, right? They, they were putting a new CapEx. The CapEx got delayed. The market did not like it. And finally, the CapEx came through and, you know, they were the, the, basically the, the original thesis did not work out, uh, you know, as soon as I wanted, but the thesis eventually did work out. And when the thesis started working out, by that time, I'd stopped looking at the company. So obviously my, I think the, the learning for me, and I think the recommendation for everyone is study and analyze a company, keep notes on it, and then maybe have some tracking mechanism where if it appears on your shortlist or radar, go ahead and revisit it, right? And then the perennial problem of selling compounders early. Again, when I started, my background is that I started uh, working with Asian paints, uh, as, you know, when I, when, I, when I passed out from my MBA and uh, intimately knew about consumer companies. So I was obviously invested in Asian paints, I invested some of the other, before they became the, the darlings of the investment world, uh, these companies were, uh, used to sell like this, they were obviously valued slightly higher, but, um, they used to sell at fairly decent valuations, which is almost, you know, almost no one can believe that, but Marico at one point sold at five to seven times, or maybe 10 times earnings. Asian paints was at 15 times earnings. And then, so I bought these stocks, but as they kept going up, being a, a, a very, you know, dyed in the wool kind of an investor, I know everybody would find it hilarious to think that something 20, 25 times earnings is overvalued. But if you start investing in an era, and I hope we don't get there, but if you start investing in an era where the average uh, valuations are 10 to 12 or 15 times, 25 times appears uh, quite expensive. So. Maybe that shows my age also. So I started selling as it became expensive. And then obviously these stocks just kept going up and up and up. And uh, I've sold some of these compounders early, right? So had I not done anything and I just sat, maybe, uh, you know, I've done some very painful calculations. Um, if I had 
let's say i had created my portfolio let's say in the i had a portfolio in in 2003 and 4 and i still keep all those so i've been i've always kept notes very uh, explicitly i have exactly the portfolio i had in 2002 and 3 and what were the returns month by month and so on and so forth so if i had just taken that portfolio and i just kept at it right maybe just did an sip sip into it or just kept that exact same portfolio it would have covered up all the mistakes and all the losses which i have done till date right you know that's the maybe that's the you know that that is what happens when you, when i say uh the upside on on some of your companies you know can cover all the all the loss which you can do so let's say if i had just bought uh, balaji amines and done nothing right just a dumb portfolio where you just threw darts on the on the on the uh you know on the on the uh, pick list or something or maybe just picked up stocks randomly and somehow i landed up with balaji amines and i'd kept that 100x on that think of it right a 5% position 100x is what 50 times right it will cover all my mistakes and maybe one of my uh, of my kids uh, mistakes also right there is no you know how much how much can you how many stocks can you keep losing right in a 20 stock portfolio you can't lose 50 times of your uh, uh, of your you know or 50 positions right that's what it is right 5% into 100 is 50 50 is 50 times right of that particular position or of the portfolio right so you can see the math so anyway these are you know these are these are uh, mistakes and i think now slowly i am getting into a situation you know it's a long time but i'm getting into a situation where i will just shrug that i made a mistake again i've thought a, i've thought long and deep about it how to and we can talk more about it as to how to how do i structure these mistakes uh, into the investment into the investing process and you know take it take it with your stride it's it is it is still painful it's never fun that oh you know you feel very thrilled about making a mistake but at least you know that it is going to happen so might as well build it into your process and move on with it so i'll stop here ankit uh, you know i don't want to just keep talking as a monologue uh, we'll 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 keep it q and a in between if i uh, if i already have a slide on that point i will go to that uh, but let's let's start off with uh, with qna sure. so uh, rohit first question is from my side only uh, right so you mentioned about a few uh, few question as in few stocks where when you sold off it didn't go well and then uh, there there were two kinds of stocks one one kind of stock didn't do well uh, as in it didn't go anywhere while you were holding right and then there right. were stocks where uh, it did well for a good period of time you booked profit and then it continued to do well and then there would be some stocks which uh, you continue to hold for a long time and right. it didn't perform right so correct, correct. my question as in i still feel and face that problem in my own personal portfolio and portfolio of our clients is that it is very 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 difficult to to make that judgment call Uh, on Correct. which one is those three type of uh, uh, category, right? Correct. So how do you deal with that problem today? Correct. So one thing I think, uh, and I'll, I, you know, I know this is a recorded session, so but I will still uh, speak my mind on some of these things. I think the first thing we all should kind of internalize is that it's only on social media and media that everybody is hundred percent correct, right? and it's not about just stocks right look at what happens on social media right on instagram everybody has a pers- has a perfect life on uh, linkedin uh, everybody has the perfect career right so it's it's all uh, it a lot of it is just uh, just sh- just show and tell right everybody is making the same mistakes uh, so i think that's the first thing right we should not agonize now to your question ankit it's it is uh, it it is it is not easy obviously uh initially what i would so i'll i'll give a little bit of a a a, a more uh, uh, expanded answer initially what i would do is this also has changed over the years because the nature because how how the mar- of how markets currently react to any actual or perceived mistakes right so yeah, at least in my mind i break it down into two portions first is what type of a position this is 
so let's say we'll just for simplicity sake uh, we will say let's say you you hold a company um, again i you know maybe i'll take a example which i i you know it's always better to take examples which you don't hold right it's it's safer also so let's say you hold a company let's 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 pick one example let's say you hold navin florin right by the way i don't hold that company i followed the company for but for whatever reason i don't hold the company so you 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 bought a company called navin florin and you have done enough research enough work on it right now again this is just as an example right instead of saying a uh, stock a b or c we know or at least based on the work which we have done and most of of you who would follow this company this company has done fairly well and quite consistently for a, a, a long period of time right so they have you have seen that the management uh, has done a good job uh, they have performed fairly consistently and they are fairly predictable in nature so in this case independent of what happens uh, i would be more inclined to hold this company and that's what i've done with some of the positions i've held like abinity organics which i continue to hold you give more leeway so when i think when the first category which you mentioned happens that the stock is not doing something uh you know it is it is a given that any any stock which you hold if you think it's a, a long term compounder right the, that word which gets thrown about a long term compounder does not mean and again i'm not directing at at you specifically ankit but uh i'm just making an example it's not that if it has to do 20% cagr it will do uh 20% cagr every year every month right it's not evenly uh, broken out it all uh, most of the times it happens in spurts it's true for individual portfolios it is true for companies so you have to think about if that is my thought process there will be long periods of time where the stock will do nothing so one has to be comfortable doing that one has to be comfortable uh, holding a stock uh, which i have done i think there's a question saying did i have have i experienced yes there are stocks which i have held which do nothing for periods of time by the way the business is still doing well business is still growing the management is holding what they need to do is that the stock is not doing well so that's category number 1 stock does nothing again how do you distinguish it from a case where you should be selling and that i have been guilty of that also i'll talk about it maybe i have a slide also you should not be a, a blind buy and hold investor it is buy and then you know continue with your with your evaluation of the business and i keep saying evaluation of the business the business should keep making progress the stock will eventually make profit so that's about holding something but at the same time let's flip that around what if a stock is not doing anything should you always hold it no when you when you go through a conference call i do a i do a very simple check these days is the management talking about a turnaround or something changing every the, the next quarter or the quarter after next but they always keep up, keep coming up with a reason industry is bad sector is bad something this happened that happened have a time you know have a have a time kind of a, a bucket where you would say enough is enough now let's move on i keep it at 2 years now used to keep it very long but now i have shortened it so that's scenario number 1 scenario number 2 is let's say the stock suddenly drops right at 20 30 40% that's where it gets tricky uh originally i would just sit through it but i've started exploring the concept of stop losses right like you know at what point the biz, of, often what happens and this is the case now that markets have become more and more efficient so these days markets do get a inkling of um, of something being wrong in the business before you before it shows up in the in the numbers so maybe uh uh you know it makes sense to to at least start looking at it from a position size perspective and cut your losses something of that sort but again it's context specific you cannot have a general rule if you if you if your tendency is to hold it for 3 to 5 years and the stock drops 30 to 40% you have to evaluate is it a problem in the business do i still have confidence maybe can i still add it you know things of that side but this is definitely not a, a smart thing to do as far as cyclicals are concerned let's say you bought into a steel company right and the stock suddenly drops 20 30% not a very good idea to just sit and just hold on right so that's that's about a sudden a sudden drop what about a sudden you know a consistent increase i would say you know look at your position size and see what you are comfortable with 
do you really want to hold 10, 15, 20% in a single position? So maybe you start taking, now again, something which is going to go 100x, do you want to let it run? Uh, again, a very personal view. If, if, if you allow that to happen in your entire portfolio, by its natural means that one position will become maybe uh, 60, 50, 60, 70% of a portfolio. It's a good thing, but usually I, you know, I'm not very comfortable. Again, it varies from person to person. So Ankit, hopefully this answers, you know, all the three scenarios, right? Uh, something which does not go anywhere, something which drops quickly. And maybe, you know, uh, if you're lucky enough to see something go up really big time. So again, a very case to case kind of an answer. You have to, it's just very stock specific, very context specific. There's never a formula as such. Right, right. Thank you so much, uh, Rohit. So I'll just uh, read the disclaimer once again. So Rohit might be using the name of a few stocks to drive home his point. Please do not consider this as a recommendation. Right. Uh, we both are SEBI registered investment advisors. So idea is not to give any recommendation here. So uh, Rohit, there are yeah. So there are a few uh, questions from the chat box. Do you want me to take them now or? Yeah, yeah, we, yeah, we can take it. them. Let's do it that way, right? Uh, uh, I will keep the slide deck open. I will jump sure. to that particular slide. I am not seeing the chat box myself because I'm in this presentation mode. So maybe no problem. You can, no you problem. Can really curate and you can ask me the questions. Sure. So Rohan asked you, uh, this question. You said to create a portfolio based on success rate. So two questions here. How many years data did you take personally to determine your success rate? And number two. Personally, what is your success rate and how do you determine that you have gone wrong in your study? That I think this is a very good question. It's a good question. So I'll I'll try to keep the answer, you know, I won't I don't want to go too much into a uh, into a long winded answer. So let's let, I'll just quickly go through this. So the first thing when I started off again, I've always I've always been very skeptical about my own uh, investing skills right from the beginning. My biggest worry right from the beginning was, am I lucky or do I really have the skill? So in the initial five to 10 years of my investing, and I know that sounds very, very, very a long time, uh, but you have to keep in mind, this is during the time when there was no social media. So you could do your thing without feeling the pressure. I was invested almost equally in mutual funds and in stock. So I would keep, I would, I'd kept a, a kind of a threshold at five to 10 years. I did a little bit of Google and the people will say three years, four years, five years. I just kept it as a cutoff of, of roughly around eight or nine years. I, I kept looking at my results. Initial three, four years were a complete disaster, but starting from 2003, things really took off. So by 2007 and eight, I, I was looking at the, the numbers and I felt confidence that I could invest more and more actively. So by the time I, st I started my uh, advisory, which was, you know, sometime uh, around 12 or 13, and then the SEBI regulations came through also, uh, I had completely moved out of uh, mutual funds into stocks. And my, my, a few thumb rules were initially I wanted to hedge my bets, do only mutual funds and do stocks till I had enough confidence that I was doing better than mutual funds. So that better being, you know, can I, can I be in the top five to 10 or maybe 20 percentile of all mutual funds? So that was my threshold, right? So, uh, I used five, you know, around 10 years of data to come to that particular conclusion because it's, it's your, uh, lifetime savings, right? So I didn't know I wanted to hedge my bets. My own uh, estimation about the numbers, which I have is around 60, 65%. Again, it, it goes up and down, but that's my. That's my estimation. So what is a, what is, what do I call, how do I calculate it? Any stock which has at least done the same as an index, I would say, okay, you know, it's, it's fine. Right. So I will take NEC 50. I mean, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not, I don't, I don't want to get hyper, uh, you know, scientific in this, right. It's not like, uh, some stocks where you lose money, it's very easy, right. Straightforward. And some stocks you will make money and some stocks you will make a lot of money. It's the typical, a uh, dispersion you will see. So any stock which has done same as, as the index or, and I'll just take NSE 50. You can say, why not take it small cap, big cap, forget it. Right. I'll just keep it simple. Right. This is not a scientific exercise for me at least. Right. So 60 to 65% is my success rate. Anything which has done worse than the index or has, has been, you know, has been a loser. 
I will I will take it as a loss. And then I did this analysis maybe the last time was in 2017 and 18. And now I've stopped doing it because once you have done it for a few times, you know roughly ballpark that one in three or maybe slightly more than that will go wrong, right? So you might as well just adjust your um, uh, adjust your investment approach based on that. So hopefully, Ankit, that answers the question. Yes, right. Thank you so much. So, so next question is from Sutirtha. Uh, how does Rohit assess his performance? I think you have covered that uh, mm -hmm. fairly. What benchmark is used, and would he reassess his framework if he underperforms for more than two three years at a stretch? That's so let me let me yeah let me answer the 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 first question first. The benchmark usually I use is Nifty, Nifty fifty or mid cap index, but again. Uh, the the more important benchmark is that over the long run, you know what returns, what returns I'm making. So that's point number one. Question number two: uh, Revaluating my framework? Absolutely yes. Uh, at any point of time, I'm you know, independent of whether I am outperforming or underperforming, I'm always questioning my process. I'm always questioning my framework because you know you have to keep in mind that the markets are constantly evolving. Uh, the fancy word is that it's a it's a complex adaptive system, right? What worked for me in 2005 did not would not work in 15 and will not work in 2025. So in this uh, in this uh, arena, I think, and you know, I'll I would you know to, for all of you on this call, right? Uh, I'm assuming that you will be actively investing for a very very long period of time. And what most of us face, everybody, you know, what I have faced, most of the people will face the same thing. You know, it's a, it's hundred percent assured that markets will change, and what has worked in the past will not work in the future. So all of us have to adapt, right? So that's where, even if you have done well for five years, there is no assure, there is no assurance that you will do well in the next five years. So you have to constantly question your process, question your framework, and you have to adjust. So. My answer to the second question is a hundred percent absolutely. I'm I don't even I'm not even thinking about it. Okay, two years from now I will assess it. No, it's a constant process of thinking about it, of of seeing what what is working with others, following other investors, seeing how people are performing, what's their thought process, try to reverse engineer, speak to them, understand that, and then look at you know what is going wrong at your end. So so absolutely yes. Uh, uh, it, it goes without saying that you know you have to keep keep reviewing your process, but no, you know not too much also, right? Because there will be, it's a you know you will per, underperform from time to time. Again, uh, a good year means what? You get one company right, or you get two companies right, and uh, that year goes very well, right? You get one cycle wrong, and you are you, you are in trouble, uh, or you at least will underperform, right? So, so it's a, it's a little bit of a tricky thing. So I think the, the best option is to keep introspecting and, you know, keep questioning your process. Don't assume that, you know, you are so smart that you have figured it all out. Right. I mean, that usually never happens. Uh, so Ankit, Rohit, yeah. the questions. The, yeah. Thank you so much. Rohit. So the questions will keep coming in. So you can just let me know when you want to go back to the presentation. That's fine. I will, you know, if a question comes up, which, uh, uh, which I've already covered, I will go to that particular slide deck. So uh, I will do okay. that also. Great. Great. So next question is from, uh, uh Vinod. He, uh, basically quotes, uh, Peter Lynch, uh, right. where he says that in, in this business, if you are good, you are right. Six times out of 10, you are mm -hmm. never going to be right. Nine times out of 10. So I want, uh, he wants to know whether you agree with that. Or not. Oh, yeah, yeah. Or you my have own data, I've seen my own data. I've seen a lot of data from other people. That is absolutely true. On social media, people are 95% correct. <laughs> right. But uh, <laughs> yeah, in reality, and again, it's, it's average data over a long period of time, right? You will have, I can tell you from experience, there will be times where things don't work at all. Right. And you will question yourself. And then there will be times there where everything works. Right. And you will feel like, uh, you know, you will you will feel very smart. So it it uh, it goes without saying, uh, which is why I keep. Uh, let me come to this particular. I think you 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 spoke about. Uh, you had asked this question. Let me quickly go to this particular. I think you had a question said. What is the important truth about investing, right? And I think this ties very good uh, with um, question which is being asked. 
right? Uh, uh, if you are, and I'm assuming, right? All you know, all of you. I, I, you know, I'm not seeing how many people. Whoever has, whoever is on this particular uh, um, uh, session is an active investor, of course, right? And you are spending time on a Saturday evening where you could have, could be doing something far more fun, also, right? So you are actively invested in the market. What I can tell you from experience and is that the the return on time and there is this blog post which I keep coming back. I wrote about this. I wrote 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 this post maybe 10 years back and then I again wrote another post. The link is over here anyway. It's a future advice to my kids. The return on time invested by uh, you know investing actively is actually not very high. Think about it, right? This is me and uh, this, this is me saying who has been investing actively for 20 years. Again, when you want to do that, it's there's a concept called opportunity cost, correct? So think about it this way. If you just did an app, you know, you, you just literally just went and and invested in index funds and just focused on asset allocation, you would make a certain return. Let's let's just be a little, you know, let's do a very simple uh, exercise. Let's say it's traditional 60-40 portfolio. You invested in NSC 50, you know, did not even expend much energy beyond that. So what? 13, 14 percent Nifty uh, into 0. 0.6. That is what? 13, 6 are 98, 9.8. Plus, let's say a 6, 6, 7 percent, uh, you know, FD or 6 percent FD, right? 6 into 0. 0.4, 2.4, right? So how much is that? 11.3, 11.4. Do the exact same thing from an active standpoint, right? Now you can say, I, I invest 80 percent, 90 percent in equities, then okay, invest that much in index funds, right? So, but for this example, 60, 40. That 15, you would invest what? Uh, that 13 percent. If you are, if you are really good, let's say you beat the market by 10 percent, correct? So, what's the delta which you are making? 6 percent, right? 60, 40 is split. So, you're making 6 percent extra on your portfolio compared to a completely passive, like zero time spent, right? So, that's the math which I did. Appeared very silly, right? But that's what I did over here. This is the money which you have saved. This is the baseline return. You are a super investor, right? Eight percent. By the way, eight to nine percent outperformance is good. I'm saying long periods of time, right? Somebody would say, Are anything less than forty percent CAGR? I don't like. If you can really make forty percent CAGR for a very long period of time, I agree. Very few people can, but if you can, you will be a very rich person. And then you know, congrats to you. Yeah, if you can, if you can manage that. But most of the people will not have that experience. So look at what extra return you are making and then divide by the time you are spending. And you will realize that I did this simple math over here and you can you can do this math for yourself. You realize that what you can make by, by via a profession and most of the people on this call and people who invest actively are very smart, intelligent, uh, people who have, you know, who have a good educational background. What they can make out of their full-time job will be far more than what they can make through active investing. So this long-winded way of saying is that if you're going to invest actively for a long period of time, do it only if you enjoy the process of investing. Right? Don't do it for the money because the money isn't great initially anyway, right? After 10, 15 years, when your portfolio has become big, that's when the crossover point happens. So, you know, might as well just um, enjoy the process of investing. And of course, if you're managing money for others, then that's where, you know, it's a profession. Then you're working, right? Then you're working. for So, so that's where uh, you know this this whole thing about active investing and uh, you know beating the markets and uh, you know how much do you beat you know that is where it all 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 comes in. So you know hopefully you know this uh, this answers the question right uh, yes. about you know whether yes, you, know, be, you know how you should invest in all that. So. Yeah, so Rohit, uh, I am reminded of uh, a comment by uh, Morgan Housel recently. I think maybe he wrote. Right. In one of his blog or maybe in tweet where he says that uh, if you are in the 50th percentile in terms of CAGR or XIR, absolutely uh, in terms of annual returns and if you consistently get into that annual returns uh, 50th uh, percentile absolutely. on the basis of it then in the if you continue it for 20 years for the whole 20 year period you will end up in the top five percentile in terms of returns. absolutely yeah 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 you know that's true you know by the way uh, uh, this this is a very fascinating and i would highly recommend people who are on this particular uh, uh, chat and who would watch this video 
last 12 or 13 years in the US market. You just Google up and go and find, comp if you've heard about this, uh, this fund called as ARC, right? And I'm not going, you know, I don't want, I don't like to make fun of anybody on social media or in person because you know why? I, I, I have been and I could be in that same position where I make a mistake and we all will, right? So why, why, why do that, right? Like why make fun of people? But look at their performance, right? They went up like a rocket. They have now come down and they are not beating the index. So beating the index and I'm, I'm very, very sure that the level of outperformance in the Indian markets over the long run will reduce slowly. I mean, you should have, if you had started off in the early 2000, it was very easy to, you know, to, to beat the index. Now, a lot of smart investors, all of you included, are putting a lot of time and effort uh, to, you know, to, to invest actively. What does that mean? That means the market is getting more and more efficient and beating the index for the long period of time will become more and more important. So look at some of these funds in the US. They did extremely well for the last 10 years and they've given back all their gains in the last one year. Just Google and you can, you know, you can, you can find out. So to Anki, to your point, just being in the middle over a long period of time, actually, you know, uh, I think what Morgan Housel, if, if I remember correctly said, you know, average returns over every year over a long period of time will actually give you above average compounding, you know, or results if you accumulate it, right? And I've seen that from my experience also. I mean, at a 20% compounding numbers really get very good over a long period of time. I mean, you really don't need 40% CAGR. 40% CAGR often, you know, it's, there's nothing, you have to keep in mind, uh, there's nothing free of cost, right? A 40% CAGR, how will you get it, right? One is either leverage or through a concentrated portfolio. You cannot have a 20, 20 stock portfolio over 20 years and keep doing a 40% CAGR. I mean, then you are incredibly smart in terms of investing. And if you are one of those geniuses, then, you know, I mean, I've, I've honestly, I've not seen anybody, uh, you know, I'll be, we've heard about Rakesh Junjunwala. Think of it, right? Concentrated portfolio in that sense, right? Titan and some of these big companies. And do you think, I mean, he was, he was emotionally built to see uh, Lupin and, and, uh, and Titan go up and down, right? So a concentrated portfolio means what? High volatility at a portfolio level. That is the price of, uh, of, of high returns. And by the way, that's, that is when you see some of the quant, uh, uh, back tested systems, right. And they talk of 30%, dig a little deeper, look at their drawdowns. If you think you can, you can, you can bear a 50% drawdown. Uh, I can assure you it is not easy to bear a 50%. Nobody, very few of us have seen a 2008 market where the whole portfolio whole market everything goes down by 50 percent covid was just a like a, a like a little a nice little roller coaster which went down and then quickly came up 2008 was really scary in that sense so so you know big drawdowns are the price you pay for you know for very high cas here so i know i you know i i took your question and we went on a little tangent but i think it's important to keep in mind that high returns means high volatility and some only very few people have the stomach to to handle that volatility. Yeah, so Rohit, uh, that, that's a very interesting point we act, uh, you actually touched. So I just wanted to make another comment here. So right. what I see right. uh, in case of many new investors, they come into the market getting influenced by Warren Buffett. They talk about long-term compounding. They right, right. Have, a, have a fairly diversified portfolio. Or start karte, then they see that, okay, the returns are not coming. And then they switch gears they try to look at the other guys they look Correct. at the completely different end of the spectrum and that Correct. is where people uh, uh get it completely wrong so it's good that you are talking about all these things which both on wala, you know, all of us yeah and social media is only making worse i think all exactly. of us including me also we get influenced more than we when we like to admit all of us do get right. influenced I, when I, I get influenced now also, we, that's what I said, right? My number one mistake is narratives, right? What are narratives? There are stories around us. So the biggest things which I'm proud of in my, in my investing career is the stupid things which I have not done, right? It, it may sound very silly. Like what is the big thing to be proud of? But you know, not buying an IPO at, at uh, 50 times sale or whatever, 100 times earnings 
it's not easy right when you see everybody making money around you believe me it's not easy when when you meet people around you and they say are this platform company and that platform company and it will conquer the world i mean look at the whole crypto mania right they're buying doge coin and that coin and this coin right so so not doing stupid stuff is actually an achievement and you avoid stupid stuff maybe at a portfolio level one or two stupid companies you can you, you know mistakes you can do but at a portfolio level then you're right so so i think yeah uh, ankit uh, you know avoiding this is not easy right so social media big big influence for all of us and it's only going to get worse <laughs> unfortunately <laughs> So uh, Gaurav asked this question, Rohit. Uh, in hindsight, it looks good that five percent of your allocation goes, say, hundred x, covering all the mistakes. Correct. The correct. tough part is, mistake is realized in short term, but good things take time. So how to handle yeah, things in that time? So that's Couple a behavioral. That, yeah, that's a very very good question. So first first step, look look over here. You should enjoy the process of investing, right? I can tell you one thing from my experience. If you don't love this process, then you know don't even bother, right? Give it to mutual funds index and just forget about it because you will have these periods where things will not work, right? So you have to really, you have to. I mean, and I, I, I based on, based on just a, uh, a guess. I'm assuming most of the people over here are, you know, on this call are, you know, love, love, love that particular process. uh because otherwise you know why would you spend time on a saturday evening correct so if you love the process you will you will tend to stick around uh, on it right so so that's that's point number 1 right uh, you have to trust that you love the process and it will work out right if you keep doing the right thing it's like learning any skill right any any sport which you picked up any game which you picked up were you good at it on day 1 no right it took time same with education right so you will make mistakes and i that's what i said right part and parcel of the game but you have to trust that i love to do this so it doesn't matter whether i make money i don't make money over time i will do well but you keep you be honest with yourself also right keep evaluating your results which is where we come in right i said 5 to 10 years right and that's what increases your confidence but i'm telling you there is nothing smart or or special about it if you just keep at it you will slowly keep doing well and you will realize that after 5 years 10 years you're doing reasonably well you know you will not be the next warren buffett or akshay junjunwala but those were very those are very unique personalities not only smart but also lucky you have to keep that in mind most of the people you hear about have also been lucky but they are obviously also smart also so you know short way of saying it is this point number 1 right should enjoy the process and trust it right trust have a trust on yourself and have a trust on the on the process that you as you are learning you know you will get keep getting better so that's the only way i can think of you know there's no there's no formula per se another simple question is from atul how long is long term from uh, for you rohit in terms of what uh, in terms of a particular position or position only right yeah generally i think he means position only i mean for me i'll i'll look at something for two i'll 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 stick around with it for two to three years if my thesis is not playing out that after two years i will exit obviously something goes wrong or you know the stock is down 20 30% then i will start thinking but let's say the stock is moving sideways the business is doing well two to three years that's my long term it's in bucket so in hindsight it may appear that a particular so let's let's maybe talk about this presentation i i think you you also had this question right i think you had this question as to what made me hold by the way sera is another company which this that that's the chart for this sera is another again a disclaimer not a recommendation to buy or sell we hold this company now in our uh, our model portfolio for our subscribers uh we bought this company in 2011 still hold it right so to this question of what is long term did i think i will hold it for 11 years no it's it is never that way it's only in hindsight you realize that you that you hold uh, you hold a company you want to hold so what i am doing is and i think a question just popped up do i review it every in every two or three years no i review it quarterly but i will review it very critically if after if it if the business as well as the company has not done anything for two years so i will allow two to three years to pass 
before i start uh, you know before i before i start rethinking my again it is context specific right if i have bought a cyclical right i have made this mistake uh, of investing in financial services i brought that up right uh, and i missed that particular entire turn right so it's not true for financials it it's true for a bit more steady uh, you know not a low shallow cyclical kind of industries but after two or three years if the thesis is not playing out then i will exit so but so so over here if you look at it right i we bought, we bought it over here went up and then look at this whole point right there is this long period stretches of time where the stock does nothing right it's almost two years three years right so let's let's take this example right let's say we bought it in 2012 by 15 you know feeling like a genius right if you really look at it the right side is not screenshotted correctly my apologies but it was roughly almost what uh maybe 7 6 7 x right so this is 2015 early right now you can say you should have exited here should have again you know bought somewhere here i mean that's obviously always obvious in hindsight but stock is going down 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 over here and then it comes back here why would you hold over here uh, all that i can say is the valuations ran up but the business kept doing well steadily so in hindsight it appears you know i i i held it from you know from let's say you know almost like a 20 30 times but look at this long stretches of time where the stock did nothing actually the stock went down by almost 15 to 20% right so so i think you know long term it's almost 2 to 3 years but only if the business continues to do well if the business is also not doing well and the stock is not doing well uh, then i exit and i think i have you know i've been guilty of holding stocks too long where anybody else who would uh, would be looking at it would have exited much sooner so again not a very hard and fast rule but uh, i tend to to my own detriment and to my detriment of my own portfolio and my subscribers i tend to give too much of rope to my companies because of which often you know uh, things go sideways and i exit much later so there is obviously a downside to it it's not all upside that it's not a it's not a there are no extra marks for holding long term right finally it's all about making returns so going uh, let me let me flip this question uh, right. what i would say i'll i'll add a counter question on this point actually right. this i'm asking with my own personal experience i'll not name the company but say mm. for example you bought into a company uh, right the business thesis remained intact but the, but the company kept on getting some external uh, correct, uh correct. casualty which which didn't let it perform to its potential which you wanted and you correct, knew correct. that the long term thesis and the strength of the business moat or sustainable advantage correct, whatever correct. you like to call it it is still there is just that the market is not uh, valuing it uh, right yeah valuing yeah. it because of these external reasons so what correct, will you correct. do that's a that's an excellent question ankit i, I face this along for 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 you know quite often and what earlier i used to do was so we have to split it into, we can split this question into two parts one is if you are managing money for others and one is you are managing money for yourself if you are managing money for yourself you know what i will just hold it and i will i will sleep on it again just that just me but i will not even care because i don't have to answer to anybody right but if you are managing for others there is a very big opportunity cost what i used to do earlier was i will keep a full position and i will just sit around and wait now what i have started doing and i have written obviously this about this to my own uh, uh, subscribers is i will cut the position side right i will cut the so let's say just just as an example let's say i started off Uh, we can take a sector again, not a recommendation, but uh, we have invested in it. So, uh, and I got the timing, you know, perfectly wrong. The real estate sector, right? Uh, I felt the real estate sector would turn somewhere in two thousand sixteen, seventeen, and then obviously sixteen, seventeen happened. Uh, after demonetization, I felt the sector would start turning, and it has taken far longer for the sector to turn. So the companies are making progress, the industry is consolidating, but then you know what, two thousand eighteen. the financial you know financial services sector kind of went down right ilfs crisis and all that so again the in the industry got a setback and then by 2020 when things like look like they are settling down then covid happened right so what do you do in such cases my thinking which keeps changing and evolving 
is that if such a thing starts happening, I would cut the position size, right? So that the opportunity cost goes down and then just keep, because there is always this risk, right? The Balaji Amines case, which I shared, right? That once it is out of your portfolio, it is out of your mind and then you would miss the turn. So keep a much smaller position, maybe bring it down to a tracking position and keep reviewing it. And when you see the industry starts inflecting and the stock starts, you know, uh, starts breaking out, then quickly and rapidly increase your position size. So uh, that is my current view. It used to not be the case earlier, but uh, you know, I, now what I do is I, I will keep a tracking position. I will not torture my uh, subscribers for, uh, for, you know, holding onto that position, but uh, you know, I will, I will keep an eye on it. If I have confidence on the management and on the industry, you just reduce the position size, right? So then the cost to your portfolio is reduced. That's a, that's a fair point, right? And so let me just uh, again ask you, so as a personal, as an individual investor, you will continue to hold on to the company, right? Because you believe that yeah, right. uh, if I was, if I was just investing for myself, right. And I am, you know, I don't have to, uh, I don't have to, you know, I don't have to, let's put it that way. Right. You have to, you have to, uh, you have to be far more cautious or you have to be far more focused on, on your portfolio performance. If you're investing for others versus what you do for you. Right. You, I would say it is a fiduciary responsibility, which all, all investors have, right. Like all, uh, investors like you and me have right where we invest for others so then obviously it's a it's a it's a slightly different mindset versus if you're a personal investor you know it's you don't have to answer anybody if you're comfortable and confident uh you know why not just hold on to it right i mean give it a little more rope maybe reduce the, the concentration but give it a little more rope. sure thanks that was really 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 helpful so uh moving on Rohit. so next question is from sutirtha uh, who are, which are the, or who are the other investors, uh, you track closely? So, uh, you know what I had originally started my, you know, my intellectual, you can say guru or who I started is the, you know, this is before he became such a, such a, uh, uh, uh household name or, you know, a, a famous name among all investors is Warren Buffett. I started reading about him in two, in you know, in late nineties, you know, you could not forget about you. If you Googled, you could not find much, anything which you found was in the U S that's where I started. And then Charlie Munger and all that. But, you know, since then I have avoided investing heroes or following any gurus. My, my approach now is different. I, I am open or I keep myself open to learning from anybody and everybody. I don't, I don't care about, uh, their degree their uh you know their name their fame or anything at any point of time if i if i see somebody performing well my first reaction is how how is this person doing it and what is their thought process try to reverse reverse engineer how they are doing it like just think right what are they doing i don't care whether that person is 25 years old 45 years old or 65 years old by the way experience is overrated it doesn't, you know, it's not experience. It's about what you are doing, right? And what's your mindset. So there are a lot of very young guys, which I, which I, which I read and I follow. And I, I, I you know, I have no problems in learning from them. You, know, you should keep your ego small. So there is no one specific investor, right? Any investor, like when Ankit puts up a video, I will watch it. When others like Ishmohit or anybody puts up a video, I, I will watch it. I will try to learn from others. So answer to your question is, you know, I don't look up to anybody so much. But then I don't look down to anybody also. Anybody and everybody, my thinking is not stock specific. I will look at what that person is doing. So whether that's earlier, I used to be very rigid about value investor, this investor, you know, that, that is, you know, I don't think that is a smart way of doing it. If somebody is investing or has a momentum style, I will read and I will study. And that's what I've done in the last three years. If somebody is a quant investor, I will read and study that. If somebody is a cyclical investor, I will read and study that. If somebody is a, is a buy and hold type, I will read and study that. So, so no specific investor, anybody and everybody, you know, obviously limit subject to my time limits. I will, I will follow them. I know it's a roundabout way of saying it, but I would highly encourage everybody to do that. Don't look up to somebody and blindly follow them, but you know, keep your, keep your funnel wide open. There are a lot yeah. of smart investors who are not well, well known, right? 
fame is not a fame is not a proxy for uh, uh, for 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 how good you are right 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 so i, I just want to add one thing uh, over here rohit so uh, apart from the investing thing what the the other thing which i keep noticing especially on social media is that investors themselves think that they are far better than the uh, business owners <laughs> rather it is always the other way around we are the followers they are the leaders right and i yeah, keep yeah, seeing yeah. this where people make fun of say right now uh, the biggest topic of making fun is uh, talking about uh, these new age companies right so ad- right, agreed right. you shouldn't have applied uh, to those companies uh, at those valuation but that doesn't give us any right to make fun of them also right because they are actually doing some work which is providing value to the society right so, so i'll just take two minutes uh, ankit to just take off on that point couple of things yeah. right so one thing i think all of us should keep in mind is time horizon i spoke about this in a prior uh, twitter spaces session the time horizon on which an op- on which an investor works and on which a promoter works is very different most of the promoters right let's keep aside that some promoters are trying to make a quick money and fleece investors but that's not the average uh, you know they are they have built a business they have you know if you if you have run a business yourself you can realize how painful how you know how much of sacrifice goes you know how many sleepless nights how much how much of a tough time has gone through it that most of these businessmen are not looking at flipping a company and then moving on to something else i'm saying most right it's not everybody so their time horizon is much longer a stock doesn't move for two or three years and look at this particular slide right like i have it in front of you do you think the promoters of sera when the stock went down by 20% will start frantically doing something no and by the way uh, the gentleman who runs the company his son passed away somewhere in 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 like you know i i forget the time exact time but i remember distinctly his son young son passed away he was in his 30 he was driving the business mr so you know uh, and i'm you know i'm i may be blanking out on the names but the 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 promoter you know he started the company his son was to take over he has a daughter now he passed away right you think a person whose son has passed away and now this company is his life's work is really caring about some 10 20% fl- uh, fluctuations no right he is building the business for himself and for his next generation and for his next so time frames are very 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 different right so when you when we get frustrated you have to keep in mind the promoter is not working with your time frame so you have to go on on the right with them the new age companies same thing right some companies and i i wrote about it in my in my uh, in my twitter feed also like the example which comes is nika right uh yeah maybe it is it was overvalued but nobody forced us to buy right like if you felt it was overvalued why why you know why why buy this right and then why take the frustrator for the frustration out on the promoter you can say right why didn't they price it correctly and all that but in, in the end it is your responsibility and it's your money when stocks go up you don't no, nobody complains right so when when it goes down you know why why blame others so i think that that whole point i think to you to your point i think ankit is that we operate at shorter time frames a lot of times promoters are operating at a longer time frame so you know sometimes you just have to be patient and let them you know let let them play their vision out right right so next question is from shivam uh, yep. shivam says that you spoke about being too rigid with valuations when talking about right asian paints has your framework evolved with respect to valuation over time Oh yeah, yeah. If I if I had still stuck, by the way, and that's another question which had come up, right? Have you changed up your uh, approach or framework uh, if you underperform? If I used to have a threshold have- of fifty, uh, fifteen uh, times PE, right? In the past, if I had stuck to that threshold, uh, I would have only invested in PSUs for the last ten years, maybe, and you know, I would have not even beaten FD returns if I was lucky. so it constantly right i have again i have a you know i have a band i you know i i cannot go and buy a company which is quoting at uh, uh, 70 times uh, earnings no matter what i mean fine i'm okay with missing a dmart right but there are there are the, the other 90 companies which went down i, I don't you know uh, at least i have avoided those uh, disasters right so so yeah absolutely right i uh, uh, as i have seen the world change i have seen average valuations go up 
definitely i have i have i have increased i have become far less focused on the pe by the way because then what i started looking was that companies which had high pe and then there is now there is uh, data also that pe's matter only if you are going to invest something for 5 plus years in the short run 1 to 3 year window pe actually is not a good predictor of return so when i started looking at that and i realized that except for a few companies most of the companies i don't hold it for like 5 and 7 years right my you know even if it's a 20 25% churn uh, maybe 30% uh, you know my average holding period is 3 to 4 years so p is not that critical but it should not be a headwind is how i think about it <clears throat> it should not be so high that you know a small misstep by the company and the market will punish it but then trying to wait for a 10 p and a 12 p like think of it very simple right as markets have become more efficient anybody can quickly write a screen which says growth greater than 15% roc greater than 15% and pe less than uh, 15 show me the companies right you're not going to find any good companies in that so uh, you know i had to change i had to adapt absolutely next question is from vineet uh, vineet says uh, one of the most difficult part in investing seems to be when to sell your thoughts on when promoters of the company are selling businesses to pe investors and moving mm-hmm. out this has been mm-hmm. happening in the pharma sector for some time now promoters build the business over a period of time and now Correct. moving out so how do you look at that uh, that's a that's a tough one uh, tough to answer also um it, again it becomes uh, uh, it becomes you know um, it's very context specific you have to see why the promoter is selling out are they selling out a little bit of a stake do they have the next generation often what happens is that in some cases uh, the promoter is selling out because they don't have a next generation coming up uh and uh, you know they 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 sell it out to a pe investor but i'm usually not a very big fan of promoter selling out to pe investors because again the pe investor is by their very basic nature is not going to it's not a permanent place for that business right the pe investor will buy and then will i try to try to sell it to somebody else you know they are holding periods or what 5 maybe 7 8 10 years right they have to liquidate most pe investors have to return money to their own investors um uh, after you know maybe 5 7 to 10 years right so what will they do right they will also sell it to somebody else so i'm not a very big fan of if they are selling a small stake that's fine but if they are selling a, a controlling stake i will look at you know who the pe investor is but my personal experience is you know p investors will usually buy a company will 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 do will do, they are long term but they are not that long term right they will they will they will dress up the business i don't want to make a generic statement but often they will they will take medium term or short term actions which which improves the performance and the stock price of the company to the detriment of the long term performance of the company right they may cut down we will never know what they are doing right we you know let's be honest with that they will take actions like we cut down r&d by a little bit right so that the current uh, stock the stock price does not get uh, you know impacted maybe they'll increase r&d a little bit initially then in 3 or 5 years when all the all the benefits start coming in when they have to finally exit and the stock has to perform they will exit but when they get closer and closer to their exit their their actions will start becoming more and more short term oriented right because they want to maximize the earnings it's almost like they're coming up with an ipo right so i'm not a very big fan honestly of you know promoters selling out to pe investors honestly speaking sure. so uh, sanchit as what do you suggest to do with the portfolio if situation like covid comes in again क्वेश्चन so this is where you know uh, experience is both a plus as well as a minus and by the way i you know i i may be the wrong person to give you advice on covid because i got it wrong right or at least in hindsight i did not get it right correct right? 
because I was very cautious. The market went down and then it just shot up like a rocket, right? So this was my thinking. Uh, I took a thought process that I don't know the future. So I will hedge my bets 50, 50, correct? The thing is this, right? Think of it this way that God forbid, and you know, we were lucky, right? If COVID had continued as a, as a problem for the next three, four, five years, right? Who would you be listening off from, right? You would be listening from people who had gone more and more into cash and their portfolios did not get decimated, right? So let's say the stock market went down by 40, 50%, 60%. And then it's not that they don't, markets don't recover, right? Markets do recover, right? But instead of it recovering in a month and a half, if it had recovered in three years, very different experience, by the way. And by the way, it has happened in, in, the, in the history of markets, right? If you look at what has happened in the US in the depression era, right? 1930s and then you know, different periods of time. So what I thought was, let me hedge my bets, right? Keep my cash around so that if, if I, so it was more like, you know, with different scenario thinking, I did not want to bet on a specific scenario, right? I saw a lot of investors did that as the market started, uh, you know, uh, recovering, they quickly, you know, uh, went, went, uh, went in, uh, you know, bet all their uh, money in the market. And obviously they were handsomely rewarded, right? Cyclicals did exceptionally well and all that other stuff. But I said, this is, this is an event with no precedent. We have, you know, the world has never seen a global health crisis. I do not know. We will eventually recover. I do not know how long it will take to recover. So let me be slow. Right. And obviously in hindsight, it was slow, but if this had taken three to five years, then, you know, I would have, you know, I would, you would have seen me on, I'm just joking, but you would have seen me go on Twitter and just, you know, beat my chest saying, Oh, how smart I was. Right. So I, I took a, a measured approach, right. But I don't put this thought process for recessions because the recessions, you know, there is enough data which you can go back, right? Recessions, uh, you know, everybody gets scared about it, but that's part of the economic cycle. Two years, three years later, markets do, uh, do, do recover, right? So when recessions happen, I usually, I usually, you know, I'm not, I'm not cautious at all. And I get, I get excited. I invest, I go, I get, I get fully invested when markets drop. But COVID was not like that, right? So it was an exogenous event, as you call it, an external event. I, you know, I had no view of how long it would take. So I was more cautious in, in doing it. End of the day, right? What's the hurry, right? If you, let's say you get it wrong, money is still there, right? So you'll get, you'll get another chance and then another chance, right? There's a long lifetime of investing ahead of you. So big deal, right? If you don't lose money, you can always come back. Like they say, right? There will always be a next train which is coming in. So you can get onto that, right? But at least that, that's my view, right? With Vinodas, uh, do you play poker? Yes, Rohit does play poker. Oh, yeah, so yeah, yeah. I play. play. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Finish <laughs> that question. Plus. If yes, then does it help uh, to strengthen temperament to take better bets and position size in investing is what his that's question a, is. Yeah, that's a very interesting question. And I've picked up this game for the last two years. Uh, I didn't want to bore everybody. So I don't know how many people learn or know about poker. It's, it's tick. This is what I, how do I, how, you know, I had this slide, right? How do I improve as an investor? I said poker. Well, I, you know, I don't want to go into a long monologue. Uh, I, I don't know how many people know about the game, but let me put it this way, right? I'm not going to explain the game as of now. The role of luck, right? And I think uh, 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 you had this question. So let me go to that slide and I'll quickly go through that point of role of luck. Right. And, uh, you know, just tie it very quickly to uh, poker, right? So these are the slides I had, right? I think all of us should consider ourselves lucky, right? We have been, we have had a, a good, uh, you know, upbringing. We've been exposed, you know, to all opportunities in life. At least I consider myself very lucky. Grew up at a time when, you know, opportunities have been given access to opportunities. Technology allows you to, you know, learn, read, understand very quickly. Uh, why should you, you know, so, so we all, all think of, uh, you know, bad luck, but just the privilege and I call it privilege of being able to invest actively in the market is a privilege, right? Which means you have good education, access to 
to to to technology and the capital and the time to invest right think of it right how how few people have that have that privilege right? so i consider myself to be very lucky right i started investing when the internet uh, took off would have been would have been a very far different experience if i was uh, uh, you know in a in a remote village in india right i would never have had had this opportunity so it's not like i was a genius i was i was lucky at that point of time right so so we are all lucky right now where does luck come in this if you play poker what you will see is that uh, it's a it's a game of incomplete information a very quick one you get two cards each each player will sit around the table will get two cards but they can only see those two cards they are called face down cards pocket cards right and then first three cards are open so you can you can bet based on those two cards initially and then you then three cards are opened up from the deck there is obviously deck of 52 so let's say there are six players playing two cards each go through a round of betting then after the betting is complete then you open three cards and then after that one and after that one right so the best of 5 and there's a sequence in which you know you 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 can say which is the best hand right whether you had a pair in those five cards or two pairs or you know things of that sort and i won't get into that uh, as of now but the point is uh you are betting against other people right because they have two cards which are hidden so you're looking at five cards which everybody can see but you have two cards in your hand right and you you are guessing what the other two people have so at any point of time similar to investing it's a game of odds you are based on their betting action and based on their history of how they have be, how they have bet in the past and how they are betting now and what is the money in the in the in the middle which is called the pot you are trying to guess what is the probability that you will win right uh it's so it's a probabilistic game the big the big advantage not advantage the big ups uh, learning uh, which you get while you are playing poker is that you see the action is very fast right you will typically pay play 10 to 12 hands so the whole cycle of seeing how luck plays out happens very fast in investing what happens is you take a position you get a very delayed feedback from the market you take a position it's 3 years 4 years i spoke of 10 years right that's that like a that's like a lifetime right how many 10 years buckets will you have in life of investing same the role of luck and and chance you see it play out in poker within like a day itself and if you played for a year you have seen you have done 100x of what you would data points of what you would get through investing and that's where you see right that you could have the best hand right and still lose and you could have a bad hand and you will win so very you know it's a very it's a in your face kind of a case where you see that uh, you know in spite of having good odds or good probability you know some things don't work out and sometimes you know the improbable happens so that's where it comes in so i would say you know it's a uh, you see it you see it live in action about how uh, you know luck has a very important factor and obviously i just tweeted very recently that uh, investors you know overestimate luck in the in the long, uh, in the long run but they underestimate it in the short run and you see that in poker people think it's all about luck but no in a session it will be about luck but when you keep playing you realize it's about skill So I think that's where it is, right? It changes your temperament. It makes you far more tolerant of making mistakes because you see, right? You would have taken all the right decisions, but you know, the, it just doesn't play out, right? So I think that's, uh, you know, that's a way of putting it. It's not going to make you a much better investor or anything. I don't know about that, but it makes you far more uh, tolerant of luck and uh, you know the the, the role of luck in, in in investing and poker. I mean, I could go on and on. I don't want to bore everybody with it. If you play, you know, you will understand what I'm saying. but i would highly recommend you guys you know all of you guys you should you should you should pick up this particular uh, game you know it's it's fun and then you know it's it's a lot of learning experience by the way so ravit i i got a chance to play poker recently for the first time right, and right. Uh, at one point of time i was winning 500 from there i went to losing 3000 and from there i went up closing the game uh, net net zero so <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> so one thing which exactly. i learned is that there are it gives you a clarity as to what you can control and what you cannot uh, absolutely absolutely yeah, yeah. and i've had i've had yes, a game, you know it's it's a it's a big window into your own psychology 
right? When you keep playing, you realize, okay, how do I think, right? And it's a very rapid feedback, right? You play, you see the result. You play, you see the result. After the session is done, you can think about it, and then you will play again. And so it's not only you can you can you can introspect on your own psychology. It's a very fascinating uh, view you get on the psychology of others. And uh, you know, one of these days maybe I will do a session on that for everybody's benefit. If but you know, obviously that assumes you play poker, so that's why you know I've been a bit reluctant. But it's a very good window into seeing you know how people invest. You know, I've seen friends, by the way, uh, you know, just, you know, again, it's a very general statement. Don't take it badly, but men, the way men invest and the way men play poker is very identical. It's all that's about that's winning. That's I will do all crazy stuff. I will bet big amounts of money. I will go all in all kinds of stuff, right? <laughs> a lot of, lot of men invest also the same way. Women, far more measured risk takers, but they will not do crazy stuff. And, you know. People people invest the same way also, right? They would buy an IPO hundred times sales, you know, why? Because everybody is buying. So yeah, and it's it's a good window of into your own psychology and everybody else's psychology. And I would highly recommend picking up this game. Quick next question is uh, from Sanchit. Uh, what do you suggest to do with the portfolio if situation? Acha, you have all, already answered that. Uh, Deepak asks in small caps. How to put stop loss for exit when you have full conviction in the business, but due to macro factor share price is falling. Uh, I'll come back to the same uh, a point which I just mentioned a little while back. I think Ankit, you had that question, that everything is all working fine, and you know, uh, don't think about it as a binary decision, yes or no. Think of it as a graded decision, right? Start. Start buying it in a graded fashion, 2% position, 3%, 5%, 7%, whatever is your threshold, right? Go in a graded fashion, right? You don't have to jump in with all your money. And then uh, in the reverse also, right? Let's say you've gone to a full position, everything is all working fine, the stock is up and everything. And then you realize, you know, things have started going south. Again, macro situation, that's where the context comes in, right? Let's say you buy a small cap steel company, right? Oh, then you should have a very tight stop loss, right? Because if the cycle turns and it can turn on a on a dime, right? Then you might as well just exit and be done with it, correct? There's no gradual exit out of it. Let's say you buy a sugar stock. You know, the last thing you should be doing is I will slowly come out of it. No, have a tight stop loss, move out, be done with it. But let's say you buy a, I'll take the other extreme, right? Let's say you buy a company, just for the example purpose, right? it's a CDMO business, right? Will you really be so worried about macro? No, right? Because what's the what's the driver of performance in that in that business compared to a steel? And again, I'm not an expert on CDMO, so those of you who are, you know, you'll have to excuse me for my ignorance. But uh, there, the capability of the management, the 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 uh, the business which they are building, the long term capabilities they are building. The relationship they are building with the with the customer is far more important, right? So takes years and decades. And I'll give you a, a, an example again. Standard disclaimers: We own this company. I've held this company also for a long time. PI Industries, right? Has a cramps business, right? How long did it take for them to develop? More than a decade, 10, 15, 17 years. I forget the exact number of years, right? Let's say the agri cycle goes down. I, you know, I'll give far more leeway, right? Because you know what? It's a, has a long, a, a quite a bit of competitive advantage and it has taken 15 years to build, right? Has gone through multiple cycles, right? So over there, give it far more leeway versus a sugar producer. So there's no, there is no simple answer or a formulaic answer. You have to know beforehand what kind of business you are in. If it's a, it's a, you know, it's like a, it's like a T20 match, then play it like a T20 match, right? Hit and run. <laughs> Right, but if you're playing a test match with that particular company, then you know, then don't, 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 then you don't swing your bat, right? Then be patient, wait for the cycle to play out, because the driver is not that cycle. The driver is what the performance driver is that business and is the capability that management is building. And if they build it, you know, you you you'll have a very big winner on your hands. So, uh, Ankit, hopefully that answers the question. You know, yeah, stop yeah. loss based on the nature of the business. 
So, Rohit, uh, I don't see any further questions right now. So, maybe you can go back to the presentation and sure. Let's let's let's, let's let's pick up a few topics over here. We spoke about uh, mistakes, right? Uh, let's talk about some of the some of the. I think that some questions from your side. I think we can go through that because they didn't get covered, right? Yeah. So, uh, you know, what were the what were the some of the wrong notions, right? I think you had that question, and I think we can go through some of the questions and maybe. One of the wrong notions which I had initially was right, and this depends on the role models which we which we. Uh, come up with right mine was you know buy and hold under all circumstances right and i think you know uh doing a buy and hold under all circumstances is a is a recipe for disaster right to the same uh uh to the same uh point which i uh came earlier right buy and hold with a cyclical company is a recipe for disaster so you should not apply uh you know some uh some uh approach or methodology as a blanket right buy and hold is not a religion you know just because somebody is doing buy and hold does not mean he's a smarter or a better investor and somebody who's trading is not uh, it's it's a different temperament different time frame you know? so so again our wrong notion in my case was i would buy and hold under all circumstances and i did that with a few cyclical companies and i realized you know i was not doing a i was not doing the right thing so i know i think that was one of the wrong notions which i realized and you know if you take a particular approach and you apply it in all context you know that's where the you know the troubles begin i think we spoke about this in terms of important truths about spoke about luck i think you 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 had this question i think uh, an important point around luck is i think we spoke you know there was this question around poker and i think it, finally it's 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 a point about you know uh, differentiating between luck versus skill right and it's it's a very important question for all of us and how do you know it somebody said number of years i would say more than the number of years what you should do to figure out you know whether you are lucky or whether is you know you should keep notes right keep notes of why you are making an investment very important right because tendency is to forget about it a decision journal you know what was the thesis why you made you know doesn't have to be fancy or anything you don't have to write a a 70 page brokerage kind of a report right just scribble whatever is there on your mind one pager is good enough Just at at that point of time, make a note and just leave it right, simple on a simple word or a notepad or something, and leave it in your folder, and review it after a few years, right? And then reflect on it, like what did you get right, what did you get wrong? You will see a pattern develop over time, right? And that's what that is what will tell you, right? Whether you know how much of it is luck, how much of it is skill. Obviously, the 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 numbers, the percentages, also your returns, but your thinking process, right? And you'll see that you know a lot of times. what notes you have made and uh, uh, what you have written out that will give you clues of clues into your thinking and you know that, that will help uh, help in you know changing your process and i think ankit you had a question around what is a, a bad process good luck you know buying ipos during a bull run right you may make a lot of money right but you know it's a again it's a little bit of a blanket it's unfair to i've seen people who who are able to buy into an ipo they you know out of 50 ipos they will find those two or three ipos and invest in it properly so there is a small subset of investors i've seen who who do a good job of buying so it's not a blanket statement by but i would say the odds of finding a good company among ipos is much much lower and that comes to your you know the game of poker right which we were talking about if you're starting odds are 10% of being successful then you know don't bet right like why do you want to go and and jump into a comp you know what i would say is which again i have changed my view also if an ipo comes out and if it appears attractive i will read about the company because usually what happens is the company will be good the business will be good the valuations are all all out of whack right so you don't have to chase the business down after the ipo study it read it learn about it park it on the side right and then after the froth has gone away and then a few years have passed and then you know all the dressing up if it was done by the investment bankers gets washed out right usually the investment bankers will say show the best amount of profits show a, an increase in profits all of that will get washed out and you will see okay how has the business performed now and if you still think the valuation makes sense and the business is good then invest right so you don't have to jump into an ipo a good process and bad luck i think there was a other uh, was like you know 
buying a, a good hotel or a travel company in Jan 2020, right? COVID was a very distant, you know, a murmur which was there in 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 uh, in China, right? So you didn't think, you know, this will come and hit us in such a bad way, right? So you bought a good hotel company or a travel company in Jan 2020, and then the whole <coughs> comp the, the whole sector, the whole economy went into a tailspin, right? So <coughs> so you can do all the right things, and you know, but still be hit with bad luck, right? I think then the next question uh, was, you know, I think why don't investors do well? I think, and I think uh, obviously, you know, it comes to around patience, right? You all think we have patience. I also think I have patience, but believe me, right? Yeah, I've also, you know, I've also been impatient, right? Uh, so, uh, and social media has a, a big, uh, big role in it, right? So. If you are underperforming for month, two months, six months, year, two years, you know, it does get to you. It gets, you know, it, it's very tough to, it very, it's very tough to avoid it. So, you know, it's, it's around, you know, patience. And then I think the other thing is we, a lot of us look at, look at investing as, as, you know, as a sport, right? You have to beat the index, you have to beat others, so on and so forth, right? So often you take short-term decisions, which are, which are not good or healthy from a long-term standpoint, right? You will. You will buy into the fad of the day, into the IPO of the day, into the cryptos of the day, and then you know it knocks you out of the game. Ankit, I think there was another question also. Maybe we can answer that. Sure, buddy. So, uh, Bidyut asks, what is your view on the thesis of buying so-called consistent compounders such as Asian Paint, Spidlite, Titan, DVs, Bajaj Finance, HDFC Bank, at any valuation and hold on for a long time? Let me come to that slide. <laughs> Good, somebody brought it. See the last point. Yeah. Avoid extreme valuations with quasi bond companies. I'll just touch upon it for a few minutes. What do I mean by quasi bond companies? So, what is a bond, right? If you buy a fixed, if you have a fixed deposit, or if you buy, buy a, a a government of India bond, what the, what happens, right? You get a standard fixed coupon every. Uh, whatever, every six months, year, whatever you want to call it, right? A lot of these companies, why, you know, why do you think the market eventually became so, uh, so, you know, uh, I would say infatuated or investors became so infatuated about it. So think about an Asian Paints or a Marico or a Nestle. Very steady. That's why we call them compounders, right? Consistent. The word is consistent and the second part is compounder. What is the consistency part of it? It works almost like a bond, right? It's not like up 10% in one quarter, down 10% in another. And then it's not like a steel company, sugar company. All of us know that. So very consistent. My plus minus one or 2%, you know, keeps chugging along, right? And they are compounders, right? Like long runway, you know, you can, as far as the eye can see, at least, you know, at least that's what investors think, right? I mean, if it, whether 20 years down the road, same thing happens or not, we don't know, but that is what it is, right? So they're almost like bonds, right? A 10-year a, a bond will give you a fixed coupon consistently for uh, for 10 years. You don't call it compounder because we think 8% not a big deal, right? But it's a it's a very it's very consistent and it is compounding only differences at 8%. Some of these companies are compounding 12, 13%. Let's assume you know their earnings are growing that. What my thesis is this. What happened in the last 10 to 12 years is as interest rates kept going down and I'd put a, a presentation and even a, a, a you know, like a, a couple of tweets also is that as this kept happening, as interest rates kept going down, what happens when interest rates go down, right? And when interest rates go down, the price of bonds go up, right? Any bond, standard math, you can Google it if you don't know it, bond prices go up. My hypothesis is same thing happened with all these companies. Their prices kept going up and then obviously a narrative developed around it, right? I mean, I used to find it funny that people were now singing praises of Asian paints. I'd worked with that company. It's a fantastic company, no doubts about it. But, you know, every everything has a price, right? Like, you know, 70, 80 times earnings for something which which is growing at seven or, and that's not the case of Asian paints. But, you know, I'm saying on average, right? something which is growing at the GDP growth rate, I'm not comfortable at 70, 80 times earnings. So, Let's assume everything else remains the same, right? They keep growing at the same pace as they have in the last 10 to 12 years. But their valuations have gone from 30 to 70. Now, what happens in an era, I'm just saying thought experiment, right? When interest rates start rising, 
when interest rates rise what happens right bond prices go down so you're talking of a head a, a tailwind now becoming a headwind so i am not a big fan and that's why i've called it out and i have explained the logic i'm not a fan of the stock by the way not the company stock of company is just selling at such high valuations and uh, you know uh, are are growing at gdp plus minus 1 or 2 percent right so uh, so you know, i i'm not a big fan of these companies they they you know they they got into this whole cycle because they were compounding very consistently and the interest rates were going down that that most likely that tailwind is now a headwind worst case it may not be a headwind but for you to make a good returns means it has to it has to grow at far higher rates than their their past whatever 10 years history because in the at a 70% if a company grows at 10% 70 p sorry then to make 15% the p has to keep rising right so i mean i would not bet on p is rising further right and their current growth rates are not really way above you know the gdp growth rate so uh, hopefully ankit long long winded answer but hopefully that gives yeah and uh, rohit uh, i think you you brought in a very important point of interest rates i remember sometimes in uh, 2020 or maybe at the start of 2021 there was a buffett interview where right. buffett says right. that uh, so the the reason i'm saying this is that we often we take our heroes too seriously or uh, hold their views uh, close to our right. chest and follow by that so he mentioned right. in that interview where that he says that i know that the interest rates are down but they can remain down for uh, remain near zero for a long period of time see correct so this is the comment which he made and if you just correct. go by that comment today you correct. in in a in a matter of a year you see that the interest rates have already started reversing again not taking any credit away from mr buffett but i'm trying correct. to say that sometimes we just blindly follow our uh, heroes that is where the problem occurs right correct correct no and uh, uh, i think when the again you know i i i put this particular ppt and slide out as 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 inflation started coming up that was the worry which i had and again luckily we in india got spared by some of this uh, 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 you know uh, you know headwinds but look at what what has happened in the in the us right a lot of these technology companies saas companies i think they have gotten butchered i mean and that is uh, you know being generous there are com- you know average company has gone down by 60 70% 90% is is quite common do a google search coinbase a saas company you know and not that their business models have changed they, they, they just, from 0% you just went to 4 5% and it has just completely killed you right now again we have this scarcity premium with pidlight titan i mean i will not put everything in that hdfc bank is not in that it's not a very egregious valuation by the way we don't uh, we don't hold any of these companies so i you know i can freely talk but i would not put an hdfc bank in that same bucket i don't know i can't say that much about bajaj finance but some of these other companies right they're going not divis also but some of these companies are growing slow right so what happens when this becomes a a, a headwind right so so that's the let me do one thing uh, ankit i'll go back to that slide again and we so had the uh, sector as well we can't see the slide now so i think correct correct you know i think again. for some reason suddenly it went off so let me let me share the slide again sure and let's talk about the sectors i think some people will be you know interested in that right what yeah, sector deepak deepak has already asked this question which three sector you like the most for next correct minutes? correct so let me and again i think you know the standard disclaimers right so uh, can you see my screen hold on let's maybe spend yeah, a little time here because i think you know people would like to you know yeah. discuss a little you know get some uh, let me i like the the words in the bracket for now for financials and correct and i'll come to it right <laughs> so i'll come to it so let's talk about this a little we will spend a little time over here and then you know if people have questions let's get into uh you know a little more deep dive because you know a general discussion often gets very boring right so sectors of choice right again thought process is two buckets right i people call it with different names but there are some companies which you can buy and you can hold them for much longer and then there are cyclicals right where that's where the for now part is correct 
because you know more cyclical in nature right so again i'm looking at a combination of growth industry structure and valuation by the way i think you had a question around uh, books there is there are two books i would recommend for all of you you know highly recommend you know read it there is one book called as uh, I, if i'm not getting it wrong but i know i i maybe i can put it up later called capital cycle do read that book very very interesting book you know uh, uh so it's called capital cycle you know just just read that it's about you know uh, how cyclical industries work and how the capital cycle goes through that right so i would i would highly recommend you know you guys to read through it you know will be very very useful right forget whether you invest in cyclical companies or not and the gist of the book is this that more than the demand it is the supply side of the whole value chain which has a much bigger capital return i think it's capital return also and capital cycle also so there there are two books actually capital return and then i think there's a printed book called as the capital cycle so just just look at that uh, so you know talks about how the supply side has a much bigger bearing on the economics of an industry than the demand side the demand side is usually far more stable but it's the supply side which has the biggest uh, you know impact on the company cycle and i'll touch upon it as i talk through this sector so that's why i wanted to and second is there's a book called as quit there is this uh, poker player her name is annie duke she's come out with multiple books i think it is her book only but anyway the name of the book is quit and i read this recently and one there are two comments which stuck out for me big time one is and that ties into stop loss and the losses we take right quitting on time you know is uh, yeah somebody posted it capital returns investing that's one book there's another book called as capital cycle but anyway coming back to that book there is one comment which stood out for me uh, selling on time always feels early or whatever quitting on time always feels early so i've modified that to selling on time always feels early when you are selling on on time when do you sell on time valuations are through the roof everybody is happy margins are at a peak stock is going up it's in the momentum portfolios uh by the way nothing wrong with that because they know what they are doing they will exit when the momentum turns it's the so called buy and hold investors who may get stuck but anyway social media all going gaga right so if you try to sell at that time how do you feel right you feel are you know i'm leaving money on the table so very good comment right um, selling on time feels uh, you know or whatever quitting on time feels early and second comment which i liked from that book was you should make your quitting decision in advance like when you buy a stock make a stop loss and a quitting decision in advance because in the heat of the moment it's very difficult to do it so anyway uh, coming back to you know these uh, these uh, these points read that book because that plays into this particular uh, the way i am looking at industry so what i like is uh, you know a lot of people keep talking about it crams agri and specialty chemicals again specialty chemicals have become a very abused term if you may right so be very cautious around it but i like the theme overall right right valuations right companies i spoke about a company which we hold right so again no recommendations i do like it i do like some of the consumer facing companies some pockets are coming up where you know it there are interesting companies in that sector again a uh, i wrote about this on the blog we don't hold it again standard disclaimers but for example right there's a company called as vector foods right so you can go and you can see it on our blog again it's not a recommendation to buy or sell i as a disclaimer i hold it i hold it as a small tracking position in my portfolio but we don't hold it in our advisory but you know it may be an interesting company to look at i like hospitals also again these are far more steady businesses uh you know with uh, uh, again i'm not by the by the way i'm not very i'm not an expert on hospitals but there are quite a few good webinars you know on the uh, on the internet on you know on twitter where we, you know there are quite a few good fund managers who track hospitals so i would highly recommend and you know uh, there are videos on hospitals so i would highly recommend you know following that so there are these are some of the sectors which i like and we can talk more you know if there are some questions financials again i said for now why why for now because this is more cyclical and why again for now why did i go into a a monologue around uh, the book capital cycle it holds true for cement if you read that book what you you know the thing which will stand out is that as industries go through a down cycle the, the industries consolidate so it's happening in the in the 
in the real estate sector it is happening in financials it's happening in in cement right very recently i just read right uh, again you know we know uh, the adani group got into this but there are there are smaller players which are constantly selling out right we saw that play out in steel we are still seeing that play out in cement where some of the smaller companies are being bought out by the big companies the supply side is consolidating financial same thing has happened right a lot of nbfcs have kind of shut down maybe not the listed ones but unlisted ones and the smaller ones uh, capital you know kind of went out because you know obviously uh, there were a lot of losses so as that book says right as capital goes out as the industry consolidates the economics of that industry improves which means it will go through an up cycle demand will come in supply is less pricing will improve return on equity will improve which will then lead to an improvement in the stock prices you will you will start getting to a peak again new entrants will come in uh you know supply will increase commodity industry right 101 prices will start getting impacted and the cycle will then go down right so that's why i said you know financials and cement because the supply side economics are improving right consolidation is happening demand continues to be steady by the way financial the demand was there cement the demand is there right 10 12% 8 9% you know it goes there is a lot of you know uh, month by month reports you get on cement cement demand in north went up by so much south went up by so much i mean it always fluctuates between 1 or 2% that's not what is going to change the economics of the industry it's the supply side same thing on paper also what i would avoid you know the 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 recent high fly, high, high flyers right just because some of the tech plays and the platforms are down 50% does not mean you know you have to jump into it right who knows how much further down they will go so let me stop here ankit let's see if there are questions from others right there is one question only from himanshu he says that does the same logic apply in telecom I think mm. he's asking about. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely right. Uh, it, it took a, it has taken a while longer. The logic applies, but you have to, and the book goes through that also quite a bit. As industries consolidate, and the number of players go down, one thing which you have to check is what is the pricing behavior of the companies which are which are uh, which are left which are left in the industry, right? Are the top Three, four, five companies are they are they behaving in a rational manner, or are they still going after market share? Like if they are still cutthroat, they are still chasing market share. Then even consolidation does not help, right? But often what happens is that after five, six, seven years of a brutal you know cycle where supply has gone out, let's say you know in the financial space, or let's say in the in the financial space also, right? PSUs lost a lot of money. Banks, you know, uh, NBFCs, right? They were lending to builders. They were lending to all kinds of uh, uh, players in the market, high risk segments, and they underpriced their loans, right? So every player becomes very cautious, right? They don't want to, they don't want to underprice their uh, their uh, and and financials also you price, right? If there's a price, right? The interest rate which you charge is a price. So they want to consider the risk. Regulators also become a little more, you know. careful right or they are they are you know they also allow the pricing to come in like rbi has taken the cap of uh, mfis right like, you know every time people will say oh that's very uh, uh, that's almost like you know mother india types uh, type of um, uh, uh, you know people see that mother india movie and then say are you know this is that uh, sahukar you know giving at 21% but i mean come on guys understand the economics of the industry if your average loss rate is 3 4 5 percent then they are not overcharging and overcharging against what the alternative is 40 40 percent interest rate from the local uh, from the local lender right 20 22 percent you can't just say oh 21 percent is high not a, a a technology guy working in an it industry not same risk as a small entrepreneur in a village right not that entrep- no no judgment uh, you know uh, on on morality or anything it's it's just a group of in, uh, you know borrowers right that group has higher cost this group has lower cost so so that pricing discipline has come in right and when that happens and when the uh, the supply has gone down usually the you know the roes and the valuations go up again i don't know whether that will happen for sure but you know appears to be happening both in financials and cement 
so so yeah same thing for telecom also right seems to be uh, you know again i'm not invested i've only looked at it from a distance but definitely seems to be happening you know much more uh, bad news for all of us right our uh, you know the 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 very good pricing we got as uh, as uh, you know telecom uh, users you know will go away but that that is bound to happen rohit i have a follow up question on this so when you talk yeah. about telecom or even in case of real estate so in telecom we have been hearing this since 2013 14 that there will be consolidation happening Similarly, in case of real estate, uh, since 2017, 18, we are seeing some sort of a consolidation happening. But right, right. still, the market took its own time. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah so yeah. in case of in case of telecom, it has just started, and real estate, me, though, maybe I don't think uh, much yeah, has happened yeah. till now. So and you're you... right. Very good. Yeah. So how do you tackle that? As in, and every industry has their own dynamics. That was my right. question. And 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 you know what? Uh, I I've. Uh, I, you know, I I completely hear you on this one, and I've I've you know I've 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 mistimed it also, and I you know I there was a question some time back, right? Who are the investors you follow, right? And there are some investors I've seen, right? They are very good cycle invest, you know, cyclical you know, investors in cyclical companies. You know, Nitin Dharmawat, you know, is one of those investors, right? Uh, so I would suggest you know, Google their names up. right and i think ankit uh, you know his his uh, friend and partner also i'm i'm blanking on his name you know you, i know him talking about him. mr jiten parmar ah yeah yeah jiten parmar you have done that session watch that video yes, yes, yes. right the, so that's where it comes in right you don't have to have one role model you should learn from everybody so both these guys are very good uh, invest you know like investors in cyclical companies understand from them so few learnings which i have realized right they, the Nitin has done some of these presentations, you know, to the CF and everything. I think you should watch those videos. I I I publicly retweeted his uh, his video also. Uh, they track industries very closely. They 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 have the knack of 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 understanding when the inflection is happening. So what I have done from a from a thought process standpoint is that if I am going to track a cement, a telecom, or any of these, uh, I don't want to bet a uh, big. before i see clear evidence of the cycle turning i made that mistake i thought cycle will turn by so and so and i went and i went you know and i created a full position now the way i am thinking is let's say this is 2015 i am thinking oh the telecom sector will turn but it has not yet turned right so go ahead and start with a 1% position 2% position and then then wait and then wait and you should know okay what are the lead indicators when they start coming up will give me confidence that the industry has started turning maybe you know the pricing is improving demand is there right so let's keep the demand part from the telecom part out right demand is going up consistently maybe it's pricing right so keep a track of these indicators and this as these indicators improve scale the position and then if you like to do technical you know analysis and all that then look at price action also right and when everything kind of comes together then maybe within a month's time you can go to full position right as as all the stars align right if all stars don't align keep it as a small position so at least that's my current view ankit that you know don't don't jump in wait go in a graded fashion and then be do all your homework you know keep your bat and everything ready when the when the ball comes right in the middle of the uh, the bat then swing right till that time you know just wait <laughs> right we have a tendency to swing early right are you know i'll hit a six right away right? you know let the let all the conditions come together yeah you may not catch it at the bottom and you will not be able to say are you know i bought a steel stock at 6 rupees and it went to 60 but you know you maybe you will buy it at 20 when the trend becomes a little more obvious so that's my uh, view as of now okay bye uh... i am reminded of what uh, mr jitend ji told me when i asked the same question to him he also say, uh, said the same thing so you just completely uh, said the same thing which he also mentioned he just added one extra point which i thought that uh, would be relevant here he said that yeah. uh, in case of cyclical companies sometimes even the management will give you yeah, a yeah. very 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 bearish picture and yeah, you as a zeher khan ke bhi paise nahi the he said na exactly some <laughs> exactly some uh, you exactly. gone to some steel company and they said mere paas us zeher khane i know i really like that <laughs> comment right that's right, what right? Right, right if you if yeah, if you you know if you want to learn about cyclical companies you know go watch those videos you know you want to learn right. about momentum 
find about investors who who are good momentum investors go read right. about them you want to do buy and hold go and read about them you want to so that's the great thing about about social media now that's a positive thing there are very good investors talking about you know a specific area in a lot of depth you know, want to learn google go and watch it that master class 15 years back you know was not there nowadays you want to learn something you will find great initiatives including what you are doing ankit right you know you can you can easily go and learn from there you know you'll become an expert i mean i've learned more on cyclical from some of these uh, investors and this book then you know maybe i learned in the last 10 years so it's you know it's, it's easy to learn and it's a good uh, this thing so rohit there is one question from atul he says that right. he is vertically or backwardly integrated a uh, good thing or it works negatively in the long run i think it's case to case but i think it would be better if you right. share your own point. i i used to earlier you know what i used to think of this as a negative uh in some cases now you know again it's are uh, you right case to case i used to think earlier negative that let's say you know and i will will talk about two scenarios right and we've seen that you know go too far and in some cases it makes sense so we'll to take two cases right uh, to keep it more concrete and again name of companies i will share but and i'll i'll share the you know disclaimer also in terms of what so let's take one case right usha martin i think some of you may be aware of it again small position in my own personal portfolio not part of the model portfolio right so again again not a recommendation what they did a couple of years back is i i don't i've not read the exact history but they are obviously into you know uh, wire ropes and they were they also had a they also had a steel producing uh, you know or they had, they were also a steel steel manufacturer right they used to produce steel right they had a big plant and if you look at their their operating history although they were a wire rope producer the company overall got priced as a steel steel you know a sub scale if you may steel producer and they they were you know obviously exposed to the <coughs> the steel cycle right so if you really think of it you took a uh, took a uh, you know a high quality business which is wire ropes you know again a high roc business and you mixed it with a cyclical low low quality in the sense you know low valuation high uh, competitive intensity a very tough business right and what did you do if you thought that are you know i make wire ropes let me backward integrate and also produce steel and supply to it why would you backward integrate so i think a backward integration is a bad idea if the if your suppliers are in an industry which is fragmented and has a lot of price competition if you if you buy from an industry which is fragmented has a lot of price competition never ever backward integrate there's no point in doing it right your suppliers are killing each other to supply to you right why you want to put your capital in that business no matter what is the logic right like there is no reason why um, Uh, a steel company should should go into the iron ore business we'll keep the specifics aside because in india we do that and there's a very specific reason from a from a supply you know uh, uh, surety standpoint but i'm just broadly i'm saying right why would you go into into you know, a wire rope business should never go into a steel production business right doesn't make sense but and that's where the but is if you are in an industry where the input itself is either supply constrained or you know you can you can you can operate at a scale and do better than your suppliers which is what is happening in some of the specialty or i'll not say specialty some of the chemical companies right like if you are a, a a big scale supplier right it makes sense to backward and forward integrate because the sum of parts becomes you know uh, greater than you know being in that you know you you can do value addition so let's say you are in a specific chemistry right you can backward integrate and if you are a, a big scale player you will be able to get better efficiencies by combining both these processes you will also have supply security and you will also have uh, you know um, uh, less volatility in your own business so in that case being backward integrated makes sense but not in a case where your suppliers are uh, upstream are themselves very volatile and you know very low return on capital so i think hopefully these two examples right uh, kind of uh, So it's very context specific, Ankit. But yeah, yeah, usually not a fan. But you know, it should make sense in some case to case specific. It can. Yeah. So Rohit, if you allow me, I have a, a relevant example here to share. Uh, sure. So sure. 
again i'll make a disclosure the, i own the company since a long time and i uh, we have also recommended to our clients also so the company i'm talking about is bkt balkrishna industries mm-hmm. so they faced this issue of carbon black in the past where at the time of need when uh, there were only a few suppliers of uh, carbon black the price shot up uh, dramatically in a short period of time and correct. not just price they were finding it difficult to source it the price to dene ke liye ready the wo log but at least do to sahi they were yeah so then it makes sense to uh, you as an as a businessman to go for that because there you are uh, making sure that your long term sustainability of business is doing well even though if correct. you calculate in terms of roe probably making correct. tires gives correct. them a better roe compared to correct. making correct. carbon black right correct. so correct. you look at the con calls during that time there was a lot of whola like analysts correct, saying correct, correct, it correct. will reduce your roe and all but when you think from the point of view of uh, from the entrepreneur it actually right, makes right. sense to take Absolutely. that kind of a long term so no, that's true it's you know it's uh, and often times you know these backward integrations are just a uh, delusions of uh, you know yeah. expansion but you know it's in i would not I, you know i can't put a specific percentage but usually it's you know it's it is it is small but in some cases i think the thumb rule to use is is you know what 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 is the nature of the industry which supplies to you right let's say you you make uh, i'll just make an example up right let's say you make um, chocolates and all of that like cadbury's or something right and there's no reason to backward integrate into sugar right like what's the value addition you will do over there right? correct so an extreme example right whereas in the right. example which you said if it's a very key ingredient and you are buying at scale if it is a small quantity then you know you have to learn to live with it right like you know there's no point in but if you buy it at scale and you can put up a economic size plant i think that's the important or economic size capacity by backward integrating then maybe it makes sense from supply security and all that stand right 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 so rohit uh, i don't see any further question you yep. may continue with the slide if you want Yeah, you I think we'll we'll share. yeah we'll stop also. I think soon. I think more or less we have gone through most of the slides, right? Uh, you know, we can always post this, right? And uh, uh, you know, I think. Right. So we don't have any questions. I think you know, uh, Ankit, we can. So, uh, Roita, I think I meant I had one question regarding uh, that book, Common Stock and Common Profits. Uh, if right, you right. remember, right? So, if you can share something about that. i think it's the so, closing time now if you talk yeah, about some yeah it's a, it's almost a 50 year old book right and i think one i think you were asking for suggestion something i think one suggestion i can give is if you are going to read investing books read books which are old which have stood the test of time right because a lot of i i spent the first 5 to 10 years of my investing career reading a lot of books and then i realized very quickly not quick you know 5 10 years is not quick but i realized after 5 to 10 years that the delta which i was gaining from any investing book was very low so i stopped reading any books on investing long time back so one of the books would be you know would be uh, common stocks and common profits don't go by the specific example but if you if you are really into scuttlebutt and that's the where by the way where that word comes from you would have all heard one time or the other somebody say scuttlebutt right that that's the gentleman who put that term in the 1950s by the way in the us right so it talks about how you know if you're really going to do buy and hold and that's what happens right people take a lot of these things out of context right read that book it talks about how you should go about detailed research and and a lot of people do that now but it wasn't the case 10 15 20 or 30 years back in the us how you should go about doing detailed research and re- detailed analysis on a company right but by the way the flip side is this gentleman phil fisher who wrote this book once he would he would spend a lot of time studying the company the the industry and you know, he talks about a company called motorola which you guys may or may not have heard he spent a lot of time understanding their r&d their business their customers and then once he would buy he would really hold on to it but by the way the flip side is time is is limited right so if you are this kind of an investor then obviously you cannot jump in and out of stocks right So you would spend a lot, lot of time to study and understand a company and an industry, maybe months and years together. But once he had a very strong and a you know a very differentiated view, 
he would take a concentrated position and would he would hold it right so that goes with with it right if you're going to spend a lot of time then you know figure out which type of industry or company you want to do it for and once you do it then obviously you know you'll have more conviction to buy and then you hold it then you know then you make sense because you know and that's what that book says right you know way more than the market right then you then you can choose to ignore the market but if you don't know it enough then obviously you know you should hit to the market so i think that's that's about the book i i don't know if it's available widely available or not but i would suggest you know that's a good company that's a good book to read also okay it's a widely book. available book rohit and uh, okay but uh, i have heard from many of my friends or uh, people i know they find it hard to go through that book because it is it is in old fashion it doesn't have yeah. charts or <laughs> uh, but yeah i mean like uh, correct correct it's not it's not easily digestible but i you know i i would highly recommend i mean if you think that is bad enough try reading security analysis by benjamin graham i mean when <laughs> i read it i read it actually i had to read it three times and by the way you would find a lot of those ideas very uh, very you know out of date and everything but you know i used to like i i used to like to torture myself so i read that three times if you can't read that read the intelligent investor don't read it for the specific examples read it for how to approach that type of investing so i know it's a tough read but you know if you do in an era of podcasts and videos and quick tiktok videos <laughs> i know it's a tough one but you know i think all of us who are active investors we are paid to be patient and we are paid to you know go through some some heavy stuff right only then you get paid so unfortunately you know if uh, if you want to go down that path then you know i would recommend reading that book right right so thank you so much rohit uh, we earlier thought of two hours but we have already overshoot that uh, sure so, no problem any closing comment before we uh, close this session and just uh, for everyone's uh, knowledge uh, we'll soon upload the recording on our youtube channel so that you can watch it again and again because some of the ideas which have been discussed is not just uh, for entertainment purpose we should actually go back to them and re listen and make our own notes so that we we don't because we we keep forgetting as rohit mentioned that you you must need to have a uh, a notebook where you write a reason why you bought a stock or why you are selling it what is going through your mind so these kind of sessions i would encourage you all to just not just uh, treat it as a one session and uske baad bhul gaye you should try and revisit them so soon we'll upload it on our uh, youtube channel and you can then uh, watch it there also so any last comment uh, uh, or remark rohit before we no i mean thanks thanks uh, ankit for hosting uh, you know it was it was great talking to you and you know great questions from everyone Uh, i also enjoyed and by the way these sessions are very helpful for me because when you put all these points together you also have to think so it's not i know it sounds like a monologue but i i gain from a lot of it because when you were writing these things down so i writing is another recommendation i would give you know we should all write a little bit that was the original purpose of starting the blog it was for my own learning by the way it wasn't for anybody else so i think you know very important that you write down whatever you are thinking it helps a lot uh so yeah this session was as helpful for me as it you know hopefully it is for everybody else thanks ankit for hosting this thank you so much rohit and thank you so much everyone for being patient listeners and asking some really good question with this we come thank to you. the end of the session thank, thank you thank you thank you thank you everyone